You'll likely have heard the phrase downforce referred to a fair bit when watching F1, and it's for good reason. Downforce is a very important integral factor in what makes a Formula One car drive fast on a track. But why? Let's break it down. Force. Let's start with a quick definition. <clears throat> downforce is a vertical aerodynamic force acting on a car. As the car moves forward, traveling through the air, the downforce pushes the car towards the ground. Effectively the opposite of what lifts a plane into the air on takeoff. To give you an idea of how much downforce a Formula One car can generate when a car is traveling at around say 150 kilometers per hour or 93 miles per hour, the amount of downforce on the car is almost equal to the minimum weight of an F1 car, 795 kilograms. At max speed, that force is over five times as powerful. The teams work super hard to maximize this downforce in the places that can benefit from it. For example, being able to push the car more into the ground on tight and twisty corners, generating more grip and traction so these corners can be taken at higher speeds. So, what do the teams do to master and be at one with the downforce? It all comes back to the aerodynamic design of the cars. A large amount of the downforce is impacted by the floor of the car, but also crucially with the front and rear wings. Regardless of aerodynamics, downforce is constantly being created by every piece of the car that comes into contact with the air. The challenge is, how can teams manipulate and control those parts to work in harmony with the natural forces at play? One way the teams achieve this is via the front and rear wings, changing the size and angle of the wing elements to provide different downforce levels. On a high-speed circuit with long straights, for example, the wings are smaller and nearly flat, allowing air to travel through them with less resistance. But on a twisty circuit, where downforce is essential, the surface area is larger and can be angled more against the airflow, turning that passing air into additional weight pushing the car towards the ground and improving grip and traction through corners. This is just one of a few ways the front and rear wings and other elements of the car are designed and utilized to work with the natural forces on the car and turn it into improved performance. How smart? To achieve the almost unbelievable, remarkable speeds and performance of an F1 car, you need a combination of raw engine power and expertly crafted aerodynamics. Engine performance has become more and more comparable between teams over the years of F1 racing, which has made way for the mastering of drag and aerodynamics, giving teams the edge on their rivals. It's a huge part of the process, with teams hiring hundreds of staff across different departments to make sure performance levels keep going up and up and up and up and up and up and you get the picture. Let's start by talking about a small or not so small thing called drag and how it impacts an F1 car. <coughs> Drag is an aerodynamic resistance or force that works against the direction of a moving vehicle. Simply put, the more airspace a car is taking up as it moves forward, the greater the resistance against it is going to be. As the car goes faster, the drag increases. Catch my drift? In a sport where speed and efficiency are super important, drag is detrimental to quite a few areas that you wouldn't want it to be. Performance, top speed and fuel consumption to name a few. Not at all ideal for racing Formula One cars. Imagine the difference between throwing an expertly folded paper airplane through the air versus throwing a really rubbish, badly folded one. We've all done it. Or the way the air feels through your hand when placing outside the window of a moving car. More force against your hand if it's facing up rather than flat facing the ground, right? Make sense? On the team side, various specific aerodynamically designed elements and components on the car work to reduce drag. Remember the paper airplane example? Great. The two main sections of a Formula One car's front wing, the end plates and the cascades, are specifically designed to direct airflow around the tyres and underneath the car. The aerofoil wing shape creates higher pressure above the wing than below it, which pushes down on the wing. This is true of both front and rear wings helping to make the car great at cornering where the demand for grip is high. There is an element of increased drag as a result of this, but this is seen as a necessary evil, given that the speeds are slower through the corners. Does the term DRS ring any bells? Time for a quick history lesson. Back in 2011, a new rule was introduced that allowed cars to have a system installed via a rear wing component to help further reduce drag, helping make the cars temporarily faster so drivers had more chance to overtake others on track. This is called the Drag Reduction System, or DRS, and it is fundamental in modern F1 racing. 
The DRS is a driver controlled device that adjusts the position of part of the rear wing. The idea being that by opening up part of the wing and allowing for more air to pass through it, without interruption, drag on the car is reduced and straight line speed increased. It reduces drag, drag reduction system. Makes sense, right? DRS is a crucially important aspect when following a car as the air a car in front has just driven through, using all of its aerodynamic wizardry, is turbulent. So, the wings of the car behind aren't as effective. DRS counters any loss in cornering grip by making the straight line run up to the corner faster when DRS is activated, giving the driver a chance to pass the car in front before the corner. DRS can be used at any time during practice and qualifying within a dedicated DRS activation zone or zones on the track. However, during the race, it can only be activated when you are within a second of the car in front at the time you enter an activation zone. This keeps things interesting, as drivers push to get close enough to the car in front while the driver in front has to push to stop that happening. When a driver is within a second of the car in front, they are alerted via DRS dash lights and can manually activate the DRS via a button on their steering wheel once they have passed the line on the track that indicates the start of the DRS zone. They then can use the reduced drag plus added speed to try and overtake. The DRS is then deactivated when the driver brakes before the next turn, so they need to make it count. The same rules apply for any driver within a second of the car in front, even if it's a lapped car, which means sometimes multiple cars may be able to activate DRS within the same section of the track. It's always exciting when that happens. For drivers in front being chased by others, their race engineers might update them over the radio about the gap between the driver or drivers behind, giving them the option to push and maintain a gap of more than a second, and therefore stopping the driver behind from being able to use DRS. It's a strategic old game, this F1 business, isn't it? You've heard about downforce from wings. You've heard about the drag that high wing angles produce. But let's take a look at some of the aerodynamic awesomeness going on underneath a Formula One car and a little term known as ground effect. Ground effect is just another example of the wizardry that goes on in the aerodynamics department of F1 teams. Simply put, ground effect is a way of manipulating airflow underneath the car to create a sort of vacuum, sucking the car to the ground and improving cornering grip and traction. The ability for teams to use ground effects returned to F1 in 2022, after being banned in the 1980s when there was still much to learn about aerodynamics. So how does it work? Ground effect is all about trying to create an underside of the car that can expand the airflow passing underneath as it moves from front to back, generating an area of low pressure that pulls the car towards the ground. This then adds force onto the tyre on the ground, adding to grip. More grip means more speed and control through corners, especially on the entering and exiting of a corner. This ground effect aerodynamic approach has another benefit over wings though. It reduces turbulence underneath and behind the car once the air passes through the diffuser at the back. Reduced turbulent air behind the car means other cars can follow more closely before overtaking. Closer racing equals more excitement. Aerodynamic efficiency, dirty air, slipstream. These are phrases commonly used when talking about F1 racing. But what do they mean? Let's start with dirty air. And no, this has nothing to do with actual dirt or smoke or anything like that. To help it make sense, we need to consider all of the aerodynamic forces at play on an F1 car and the elements of the car that require these forces to work. For the front and rear wings to work at reducing drag and improving downforce, they need a steady flow of air passing through them at good speed. Dirty air is what exists when following a car in front closely. As the leading car cuts through the air, it distributes the air away, meaning the car behind doesn't have the same amount of air-related forces to work with, impacting the ability to produce downforce, grip and traction. Two words, one goal and the difference between winning or losing. Any guesses? I'll tell you, aerodynamic efficiency. It might sound like you're back in a physics lesson, but achieving this consistently is huge towards creating a car that can win races and championships. So what is it? It's the balance between the multiple aerodynamic forces on a car as it's moving forward, namely the two Ds, drag and downforce. Reducing drag, a force that works against the car as it travels forwards, helps it go faster in a straight line and is something that all teams strive to do. But to be able to improve speed and performance through corners, 
and on the slower parts of a track, you need to, in a sense, increase drag by using things like the front and rear wings to produce downforce. So, how do you achieve one without jeopardizing the other? The balance, otherwise known as aerodynamic efficiency. The setup required to try to achieve this balance can drastically differ from track to track. Some circuits will have high speed layouts, long straights and fewer slow speed corners where less drag and downforce is required, whereas others may have hairpin after hairpin and fewer straights where optimal downforce is essential. The aerodynamicists of the teams have to create as much downforce for as little drag as humanly possible. The setup of the car, and more specifically the angle and components of the wings, as well as the diffuser and undertray, are how they go about achieving this efficiency. A lot of work, right? Well, there's more. Once teams have optimised the angles and shapes of the wings for downforce, they then need to reduce the interference from non-aerodynamic surfaces, meaning creating wings that can generate downforce, but also direct air away from the tyres and onto other aerodynamic surfaces further down the car. This design process is what they call designing a slippery car. The work never stops for F1 teams, and achieving a perfect balance is no easy task. <clears throat> Slipstream is a positioning technique used in many different forms of racing, from cars, motorbikes, cycling, skiing, running, the list goes on. The idea being to capitalise on something or someone being in front, punching a hole in the air whilst you slipping behind into a little pocket of reduced pressure and drag. In the case of F1, this means there's less resistance working against the car moving forward, meaning the car can go faster, meaning you can close the gap or even attempt an overtake on the car in front. Win-win. It can also be used during qualifying to lower lap time by reducing drag and increasing speed on the straights. Kind of like using the car in front as a slingshot. In this nature though, it's more commonly referred to as a tow rather than slipstream, but it's the same principle. So, when do you actually use slipstream? The car is fastest when it uses all of its downforce to generate grip in the corners. But all that downforce isn't needed on the straight to go fast, so that loss of downforce doesn't cost any speed. It in fact increases speed due to the reduction of drag. Make sense? Great. So when are we likely to see slipstream in action? In other sports, slipstream can be used to save human energy, cycling or running, let's say. In F1, although known to be used as a fuel-saving trick in the past, using the slipstream is most common when the driver behind is looking to overtake the car in front. Slipping in behind, reducing the drag, and using the extra momentum to launch a move. There's not a lot the car in front can do to try and stop this. They could try and move across the track to break the toe, but there are strict rules here. They must only move once and do so early. Otherwise, they can receive a warning or even a penalty for unsafe driving. So there we go, all of the key concepts of aerodynamics explained, from downforce, drag and DRS to ground effect, dirty air and slipstream. These are all characteristics that make modern Formula One racing what it is today.